through 40. I want to start in verse, um, in verse 28 this morning. And uh, we're going to read down through that. And we'll just kind of reference it back as we go through the lesson uh, this morning. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. We've got quite a bit to cover today, so we'll, uh, we'll jump right into the, into the lesson. In verse 28, as speaking of this Ethiopian eunuch from uh, Queen Candace there of Ethiopia, obviously. But in verse 28, he was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and sit with him. And the place in the scripture where he was reading said this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away, and who would declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. He's actually reading from Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8. Almost word for word there. In verse 34, so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture preached Jesus to him. And as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, So here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they had come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found as a, to as a tosos, and also passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. That probably is one of the most important and one of the most powerful passages in, in all of the New Testament. And for good reason. Because we see what it takes and what's involved and the knowledge that is required to become a child of God. Over the last few months, and in particular the last few weeks, there has been quite a bit of, I wouldn't say concern, but at least interest that has, has been brought up to me in, in response to some of the other baptisms that we've had on having a lesson that, that helps our younger people, or anybody for that matter, to decide where they're at. Uh, how do you know when it's time to become a Christian? When is the correct time to become a Christian? When is the correct time to be baptized? And how do you know when it's time? I think those are very good questions. I think those are probably some of the most important questions that, that can ever be asked and ever be answered. <clears throat> and I think that, that that's something that shows interest in God. Uh, it shows something that we're striving to be pleasing to God. And, and in addition to that, make sure that our young people are going in the right direction. And as adults, as, as parents, as grandparents, as, as their mentors, as their teachers, we want to be in the position of where we can help them along in that endeavor and help them in that decision. So we're going to look at some things this morning in this lesson that can help us uh, assist them in making that decision. And I've heard for years, you know, and this question has been brought up so many times, what is the age of accountability? Uh, we're, we're, uh, as people, are, sometimes we're very concerned with numbers and we want to be able to place a number and a stamp on it to say, when you reach this age, you're, you're ready to become a Christian. But you can't do that with everyone because everybody matures at different levels and in different paces. So to say that there is an age of accountability and put a number on it, I don't believe you can do that. Does a certain person reach an age where they are accountable? Yes, but that number may vary between people. And we're going to look at some of those things this morning. But I, can't, I think the overbearing question is, the most important one is, how much do you really need to know? How much do, do I need to know? How much did I know when I became a Christian? I, I won't go back and, and talk about all that this morning, but I guarantee it's not near as much as I know now, which I don't know much now, but I didn't know near as much then. So I think we could all go back and look at that and say, when we became Christians, our knowledge was probably very limited in some respects. But there again, we still knew enough to become a Christian. So how much is enough? And at what point do we know that we're ready to become a child of God. I think all of our answers are given here in this chapter. Now, obviously, we're going to look at some other passages, but I think we have to look at, number one, what we do know about the Ethiopian eunuch and what it's, it's said that he was aware of, but also some things that, because he was in this knowledge, he also had to be in another knowledge as well. 
Sometimes the scripture says some of the most powerful things in its silence. And I think that's kind of one of the cases here in the scripture because he wouldn't come to the point that he's at if he didn't know some of these other things that God's word teaches us. We can make this lesson very in-depth, and that's not my goal. We're going to make it as simple as we can. We're going to look at, at, the, at the basic elementary principles of what it takes to become a Christian. But I encourage all of us to look into this lesson, to think about this. If you're not a Christian, think about it. I'm talking to you. God is talking to you this morning. Consider yourself and where you're at. Because as Philip answered the eunuch, if you believe with all your heart, it's time. It's time to become a child of God. So let's think about this this morning as we go through this story. I want to thank Al. Al did a similar lesson, I think, several years back. Uh, he shared some of his slides and stuff with me, and I've, I've used one of those for sure this morning. I didn't change it a bit. It was too good to change. So some of you may remember that from several years back. But again, let's try to keep it as simple as we can, and let's just run through this and um, consider what it takes to become a Christian. And maybe we'll all be better equipped moving forward. To begin with, we first got to consider what we're told. We know for a fact, without a shadow of a doubt, that the eunuch desired to please God because we read that he had come to Jerusalem to worship. We read, we read that just before where I, I actually started reading in Acts chapter 8 there. Verse 26 and 27, he's gone down to Jerusalem uh, to worship. So he was a man that desired to please God. Again, the old law uh, having been done away with at this point, but he was somebody who was still going to Jerusalem to worship God. So he had, at least in the basic nature, a, a desire to please God. We know that he was reading from Isaiah the prophet. And interestingly enough, he was reading, if, if he had to pick anywhere in the prophecies to read, he was reading the perfect spot for Philip to be called away by the Spirit and to come up to him and say, hey man, you understand what you're reading? He was reading about Christ. He was reading about the death and the crucifixion of Christ led as a lamb to the slaughter and that encompasses a lot of whole other conversations in order to explain that. And I believe Philip had those conversations with him, even though they're not listed there. He had to, as he, as he preached Jesus to him, he had to cover that. Because you can't preach Jesus without talking about what Isaiah 53 really is about. He also had a knowledge of Christ, but I would say that his knowledge, and sometimes we get caught up into, well, how much do you really need to know to become a Christian? Apparently not very much. Because... He's, his, his knowledge of Jesus was very limited. Now, it was more so in, in the know when Philip got done talking to him. But when this conversation started, look how silly of a question he asked. Now, to us it may be silly, but to him it wasn't. He says, is Isaiah speaking of himself or is he speaking of somebody else? Now, we read Isaiah 53 and we know right then it's talking about the death of Christ. Over 500 plus years before Christ was ever born, not to mention crucified, Isaiah hit the nail on the head. How did he do that? By the will and by the inspiration of God. That's how. But yet he's looking at that and he's saying, well, what's he talking about? So I'm not even so sure how much he really knew about Jesus before Philip preached Jesus to him. But we know that he did. And we know what that would entail. After this conversation, the eunuch understood that he needed to be baptized. And that's important. When we come to know Jesus, we also learn other things in regards to that and we learn to some point that we need to become a Christian. We need to be baptized. And he believed in all of his heart in Jesus and in what he needed to do. Those are the things that we know. And because he knew those things, he didn't wait around. He didn't accept the Lord today into his heart and two weeks later be baptized at a scheduled time. He didn't do that. That's not scriptural. When your heart is convicted and you realize where you're at, you do it right then. And that's why he said, well, here's water, what hinders me? There was no delay. That's what we know about the Ethiopian eunuch. But what we're not told here, I think is understood. And you'll understand what I mean as we go through this, because I do believe that he still knew these things, or else he wouldn't have said what he said. I believe the eunuch understood that Jesus, not was, but Jesus is the Son of God. Again, he's reading from Isaiah 53, and as, as Philip preached Jesus to him, I would think he would have started there and then built from that to tell why Isaiah said that and to talk about what Jesus did and why. He knew that Jesus not only was the Son of God, but was that perfect lamb and that perfect sacrifice. He knew Jesus to be that. 
And again, I believe in that conversation somewhere. Now, obviously, he wouldn't have quoted 1 Peter, but he would have taught him things as Peter teaches us that we were not redeemed with things like silver or gold or anything corruptible, but we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb. So he would have obviously made that correlation and made that comparison. As he's talking about, here's why Isaiah talked about a lamb. Here's Christ, and this is why he came. To be the precious sacrifice as of a lamb. Now, likely, this eunuch would probably, if, if he has a copy of the old law in his hands, at some point he's probably read over, or at least Philip probably referred back to Exodus chapter 12. As a wise old man once told me, it's all about the blood. And he was exactly right. In Exodus chapter 12, the only thing that would save Israel from death of the firstborn in every house as it would sweep through the land of Egypt was that they would have that sacrificed lamb killed and the blood sprinkled and, and, and scattered above the door. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over. And that's where the Passover was set up. And really, it was never done away with. It was just replaced with something far superior, which was the precious blood of Christ. If he read of Christ being a lamb, all of that would at some point have to have been included to explain and preach Jesus to him. So I believe he understood Jesus to be the Son of God. I believe he also understood that Jesus came to save sinners. Again, when you base what he was taught off of what he said, why would you want to be baptized if you weren't aware that you were a sinner? He, he didn't want to delay, so obviously he knew that Jesus came to save sinners and that he was one. So I believe he understood this as well. In fact, Paul says in 1 Timothy 1 and in verse 15 that Jesus came to the world to save sinners. By the way, Paul says, I, of which I'm chief. So he would have had that understanding. If he preached Jesus to him, Philip had to have told him this is why he came, to save sinners. And in that understanding, I think, and Al and I had this conversation, I think this is a very good way to put it. I believe the eunuch understood that Jesus had to die for us. For all of us. He had to die for us. Again, Romans 5 and verse 8, another passage. Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love to us while we are still sinners. Christ died for us. He died for our sins. But in addition to that, it gets more personal. He had to die because of us. He had to die because of the eunuch, and I believe the eunuch understood that because the eunuch, as we're fixing to look at, saw himself to be a sinner. So not only did he understand who Jesus was, but that he came to die for sinners, to save sinners, but he did that on a personal basis for the eunuch as well. Because as you look at 1 Peter 2 and in verse 24, we understand, again, Philip didn't have all these documents with him to point this out as we are. He didn't have PowerPoint slides. I do this morning. We're going to look at some really good illustrations in a moment. But he had to have explained all this to him as he preached Jesus. Jesus bore our sins. He carried my sin. He carried your sin. He carried everyone's sin on that tree. So he came to die for us, but he also died because of us, because of our sin. Jesus came to save sinners. I do believe that the eunuch understood the meaning of sin and what it means to be a sinner. And I think this is something that's very important because we're going to look at a series of questions as we end this lesson this morning on questions that need to be asked in order to determine if I or anybody else is ready to become a Christian. And this is one of the things we're going to look at because if you don't understand what sin is, then you don't understand the nature of being lost. And if you don't see how you can be lost, and you don't see that you are lost, I don't believe you're ready. But I believe the eunuch was ready. Because he saw water and he's like, hold on a minute, stop everything. Why are we passing this right now when I can fix this right here and now? So he understood the meaning of sin and he understood being a sinner. One of the most simple passages that we can use to define what sin is is Isaiah 59 and verse 2. Sin is two things. Sin is iniquity, which ultimately, iniquity is something that you've said, something that you've done, or something that you've thought that is not pleasing to God. Now, we could go into a lot more detail on really the, the definition of that and really break that apart, but suffice it to say, anything you've said, done, or thought, been involved in, that God's not happy with. 
That's sin. That's iniquity. And with it, one of the reasons that, that sin is so bad is that a sinner, in, in the place of not being covered by the blood of Christ, is separated from God. The meaning of sin is that you do things and say things and are involved in things that doesn't make God happy. But in addition to that, that sin separates you from God. And we're going to look at an illustration that, it, that exhibits that in just a moment. Sin separates you from God. And that's not a good place to be. Because if you're separated from God, as Isaiah says here, God's not going to hear. And if God doesn't hear, we're out in the lost world without any hope. We can't continue on like that. We can't continue on in that sinful nature of where we're separated from God, cut off from God, and without hope, and literally drowning in sin, as we're going to look at in just a moment, that puts you in a very bad place. Romans 6 and verse 23, I believe again, the eunuch understood the penalty for sin. I believe Philip taught him this. For the wages of sin is death. Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So sin not only separates us from God, it not only upsets God, you might say not only angers God, but it puts us in the position that we lose not only our physical life, but that we lose our eternal home in heaven. If sin is present and not covered by the blood of Christ, you don't go to heaven. Neither do I, if I have that in my life. I believe the eunuch understood that because there was such an urgency in him to say, here's water, why not now? Because he saw himself to be a sinner. I believe he understood at least the basic nature of sin, why Jesus had to come to atone that. But he also understood himself to be a sinner. Just like those on Pentecost. Remember when Peter and the others were preaching to him and he said all of this historical thing and brought it up to Christ and then he says he was the son of God and by the way you killed him when they realized the severity of the actions that they had just took, taken part in they looked around and they said men and brethren what shall we do why would they say that because they were cut to the heart and they realized that they had done something that made God very unhappy not only had they made God unhappy, but they had killed His Son by being sinners. When we sin, it's no different. When we make God unhappy, it's no different. We put Christ on the cross as well. Remember what we said? He died because of us. Well, that's what being cut to the heart and pricked to the heart means. You realize that, and that comes full circle, that your sins and your wrongdoings put Jesus on the cross. I believe the eunuch finally understood himself to be a sinner because he said, stop the chariot, stop the horses, hold up. Here's water, why not now? You don't have that kind of urgency if you don't understand where you stand at and where you understand that at that time. Now, I want us to think about baptism just for a moment. He mentions baptism and he says, what hinders me from being baptized? He wouldn't have said that if he was kind of on the fence about baptism. Now, it's amazing how quickly... Now, we're not told how long they talked, but it's still the same conversation, and I would take it still the same day, and he learns about baptism that quick, which tells you it's really not that hard. It's amazing how man has complicated this over time, but it's really not that hard. What it takes to become a Christian is very simple. We just complicate it so many times. But I believe the eunuch understood what baptism accomplishes. Again, we're talking about the Lamb back in Isaiah 53. And we understand from, from the, the, the Hebrew writer's words there that in Hebrews 9, 13, and 14, if, if the blood of bulls and goats kind of purified the flesh but really didn't accomplish it in full, how much more, in verse 14, shall the blood of Christ cleanse you and cleanse you from, from dead works? If the blood of bulls and goats served their purpose under the old law to roll sin forward, how much more shall the blood of Christ, which was perfect, not completely atone sin and wipe it away forever? That's what he's saying. That's what baptism accomplishes. As we look there in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, it's when, when we are in Christ that we have redemption through His blood, which is the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Baptism, remember this. This is one of these statements that you need to imprint within your brain, young folks. Baptism brings you into contact with the blood of Christ. And that is the only thing that will save you. 
We have to be in contact with the blood of Christ. Not just once, but once and forevermore if we're going to be saved. So important. So I believe he understood that. Just as we looked at this morning in Romans chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace would abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, I'm just to show you some diagrams here, but as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death. It's very simple. So therefore, I believe he understood at least the elementary principles of baptism because he gets to water and he says, Hey, I want to be baptized right now. See, so that's what he was saying. He asked a question, but he really made a statement. Don't take that question as if he was confused. He wasn't. He's like, here's water. What hinders me? Is there anything else I need to know? If not, I'm ready to go into water. That's what he said. Ultimately, that's what he meant. He desired to be baptized, and he didn't want to wait. And I want to throw one thing out here. And this makes a lot of sense. And somebody told me this one time when I had a question that was brought up to them about, is somebody really ready or not? Don't misinterpret what the eunuch said here. The eunuch did not ask for permission. Okay? He didn't. He didn't look to Philip and say, can I be baptized? Is it okay with you? He didn't ask him that. Don't read it that way. Because that's not what it says. In fact, he asked a question, but he made a statement, and really what that question said was, why not right now? And I say that to say this. If there is an understanding that is present of who Jesus is, if there is an awareness of what sin is and what a sinner is, and if that person has been convicted in their heart of sin, they don't need your or mine or anybody else's permission to be baptized. What is needed is water. And quick. And that's what we see in this story. The eunuch knew he was ready. And he said, why not now, not can I now? There won't be any, hey, do you think it's okay if I be baptized when you're ready? You'll know. And you won't be seeking permission, and they won't be seeking permission. They'll be seeking the water, and they'll be saying, please get me there right now. Because I can't wait anymore. We saw an example of that not too long ago. And that's, that's the way it's supposed to be. The eunuch was ready. And I'm convinced that his knowledge was very limited. But he still was ready. And I believe those are the things that he knew. Now, here's a couple of examples. If you're like me, picture's worth a thousand words. I don't know how many times that's going to do that. But anyway, I messed the slide up there. But anyway, here's, a, here's a, a diagram that I picked up years ago from an old preacher that's retired now. So I had to take a picture up my phone and keep blowing it up to get it on the screen. So that's kind of why it looks a little... A little off. But it makes a lot of sense. Al's, Al's slide is a lot more, we'll just say it's prettier than mine. So I'm going to use it too. But this one, I think, kind of goes into it in some good detail, and then we'll simplify it even more. On the very top there on the screen, you've got God, okay? God, it traced the green line out, okay? There's a green line, and then there's a red dotted line. The green, green line is God and Christ. The red dotted line is us. But I want you to notice how they take the same path. This is what baptism does. This is the most simple thing you'll ever see. God came down to us in the form of who? His son. We, t we call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Right? So God came down to us in the form of his son. He died on the cross, that green cross, shed his blood for us, and they put him in a tomb. They buried him. Okay? On the third day, he arose, and he became the head of all things. See that? Because of my sin, because of our sin... We've been, as we've already covered, we've been separated from God and we've acquired physical and eternal death. So that puts you and I way down here, way away from God. And the only way that we can get out of that is come up out of that. Man comes up out of that and, in essence, crucifies himself. He has crucified himself. Which means that we are baptized, which means that we go down into the water, we are buried, and when we come up, out of the water, at that point, we've been washed in the blood of Christ and we are in Christ. Notice we're not the head, but we're in Christ where there are all spiritual blessings. We are in Christ at that point. Notice I wrote in there with my pen, that's the first resurrection. And if you don't have the first resurrection, which takes you out of the death of sin into the newness of life, you can forget the second resurrection, which takes you to heaven. 
That's pretty simple, folks. Just as Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and arose, we have to, in other words, sort of reenact that in our lives, showing our belief in God through baptism, going into the water, washing His blood, come out to walk in the newness of life. That's what obedience to the gospel is, and that's why we do it. Because we need the blood of Christ. Here's Al's slide, and it's a lot better. It's a lot more colorful, and I think it's even more simple. Here in the top left-hand corner is a man that is in darkness. That is sin. When you go down into the water, you die to yourself. You can see he goes down under the water, and what happens there is you're crucified with Christ. You're united with Christ in the likeness of his death, and when you come up out of that, the darkness is gone, and it's all light. That's what baptism does. You don't have that. That is not possible without baptism, which puts you into the blood of Christ, into his body. Did the Ethiopian eunuch understand it to the degree that I do today and that you do, and could he have preached a lesson on it? Probably not. But he understood the, the, the basic essentials of what baptism does. It puts you into Christ, it washes you in his blood, and it makes you a new person. And nothing's changed, it still does that today. That's what baptism does. And that's about as simple as you can make it. And Troy, you know this passage. After we've done all of that, what happens? We've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer we who live, but who's living in us? Jesus. And if Jesus is living in us, then that means that His blood is flowing through us, and by that we are saved. And as long as we remain in that light, we'll continue to be saved. That's why the eunuch went away rejoicing. That's why he was so happy that day because he understood that he had been washed in the blood of Christ and his sins were gone. And not only that, as long as he stayed in the light of Christ, as 1 John 1 and in verse 7 says, that blood would continue to cleanse him from that point forevermore. That's what it takes to be saved. The world will complicate that. They will tell you something different. They will tell you that you're saved before you're baptized. I don't see it in God's Word. But I do see this, and it's very simple. Even the most elementary biblical scholar like the Ethiopian eunuch can understand what it takes to be saved. I do believe he knew those things. I do believe he understood what he was doing. And if we understand that, then it's time to be baptized. Now, here's probably the most, I wouldn't say the most important part, but I know this is what some of you are really looking for, and, and this is why I put this little slide together because it's so important. And it helps me too. I've, I've actually gone through these questions several times over the years with different people. Should I be baptized today? Here's how you answer that question. You follow the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Isn't it amazing how simple it is? The Philip, Philip was caught away by the Holy Spirit and said, go talk to this guy and tell him about Jesus. And there we've got the, the layout of what it takes to become a Christian. Number one, do you believe in Jesus? Do you understand what Jesus did for you and because of you? Do you understand what sin is? It's interesting that, that I have asked some people in times past, do you understand what sin is? And they'll say, yeah, I understand what sin is. And they can even define it for you. And then I ask the question, well, are you a sinner? And they'll say, yeah. And I have asked them in addition to that, well, if you died today, or if Jesus were to return today, do you believe you'd go to heaven? And they would say, yeah. There's a little bit of a disconnect there and maybe a, a lack of conviction if they say yes to both questions. If I say I'm a sinner and I haven't been baptized, but I also say, yeah, I believe I'm going to go to heaven if something happens, I don't believe you're ready. Because you have to be convicted of sin and understand what sin is fully and feel that weight to go into that water grave of baptism. But there is coming a day where someone will say, I understand what sin is, I understand that I'm a sinner, and I know if I die today, I'm not going to heaven. I remember that day and what I felt like. And you can probably remember that point too. Nobody had to tell you you were there, did they? Nobody had to say, well, do you think you're ready now? No, no you, you knew because you knew you were lost. When those questions are brought up in that manner and you say, well, do you believe if you died today, would you, would you be there? And they say, no. Get out of their way. Because they're ready. 
But in addition to that, do you understand what baptism is? And what it accomplishes? And most importantly, in addition to all of that, are you ready to commit your life to God? If the answer to those questions are yes, with the understanding that we've just talked about, then our answer to them is, just like Philip answered the eunuch, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And at that point, let's find some water and let's find it quick. Because that person is ready. Isn't it a beautiful thing? Isn't it an, isn't it an awesome joy, guy, when, when somebody's ready to become a Christian? When somebody's lost and now they're found? There's much rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Whether that means that they're becoming a Christian or they're being restored as a Christian, there is great joy in that. That's the greatest joy that we can ever experience in this life as individuals and as parents and as grandparents and as brothers and sisters in Christ to see somebody be saved in Christ. I hope we understand that. And I hope we make it our life's goal to get to that point ourselves but to also help many other people get to that point. If you believe with all your heart, Philip said, being led by the Spirit of God, he said, you may. And if you're at that point today, we hope that you'll become a Christian. It may be that you've strayed away, and maybe since you've become a Christian, you've just forgot just what a blessing and what an honor it is to be a child of God. You can be restored, and you can be put back into that place that you need to be as well. And we're here to help you in any way. I hope that answers some of the questions that some of you had. I hope that was simple enough. I, I tried to make it as simple as we could. But if you have any questions or any concerns, we'll talk about it. We'll study more. I'll sit down. We'll talk with you. The elders will. The deacons. We'll work through it. But the blood of Christ is so powerful. Have you been washed in it? And are you still being cleansed by it? If the answer is no, let's make the changes today. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?